Mexico, from the Olmecs to the Aztecs, by Dr. Michael Coey and Rex Kuntz. Chapter 7, The Epiclassic Period. When Teotihuacan fell in the 7th century AD, the central unifying force in Mexico, and indeed all of Mesoamerica, was gone. The largest city in Mesoamerica was now reduced to a quarter of its former population, which was still substantial in pre-Columbian terms. It was never again a major political force, however, and the loss of that centralizing force left a large power vacuum in ancient Mexico. Into this vacuum stepped a number of smaller cities, each vying for power and prestige in the wake of the great capital's fall. Between AD 650 and 900, these competing cities developed new political and trade alliances and eclectic art styles, thus recreating the political, economic, and cultural systems of ancient Mexico after the loss of its imperial capital. The Maya Connection Takashla and Xochicalco. One of the more intriguing epiclassic developments was the appearance of foreigners, almost certainly from the Gulf Coast lowlands and the Yucatan Peninsula, in the highlands of ancient Mexico. The interrelationship of the highland Mexicans and the Maya has been established by archaeology, but this was usually the domination of the, by the former of the latter, such as the takeover of Camino Juyu by Teotihuacanos. During the Classic period, there must have been at least one enclave of Maya traders at Teotihuacan, and a fine Maya jade plaque in the British Museum is supposed to have been found at that site. The Maya, with their advanced knowledge of astronomy and sophisticated writing system, probably exerted considerable intellectual and religious influence over the rest of Mesoamerica, and there is some evidence that the dreaded Tezcatlipoca, the great god of war in the royal house in post-classic Mexico, was of Maya origin. Moreover, Maya civilization was experiencing its most active flowering during this period. Building activity at numerous Maya centers reached its zenith, as did the internecine strife brought on by the competition between the two great alliances in the area. That centered on Tikal, old ally of Teotihuacan during the Classic period, and that led by Calakmul, the metropolis to the north and here to a kingdom even older than Tikal. Although we do not fully understand the dynamics, it seems that Maya rivalries and their Concomitant search for alliances played a part in the repartitioning of ancient Mexico during the Epiclassic. The site of Cacaxla contains the most important evidence of powerful Maya groups in the heart of central Mexico. Cacaxla is one of a number of hilltop sites in the Puebla Tlaxcala border area and lies only 15 and a half miles north northeast of Cholula. The early chronicler Diego Munoz Carmago tells us that it was a seat and fortress of the Omeca Xicalanca whose capital was then Cholula. The name Omeca, not to be confused with the archaeological Omex, means people of the region of rubber, that is, of the southern Gulf Coast. Xicalanca is another Nahua name, referring to the people of Xicalanco, or land of calabashes. Xicalanco was an important trading town in southern Campeche, controlled by, by the Putun, Mayan-speaking seafaring merchants whose commercial interests range from the Omeca country, along the coast of the entire Yucatan Peninsula, as far as the, as the Caribbean shore of Honduras. The late Sir Eric Thompson once referred to them as the Phoenicians of the New World. In November 1974, looters were discovered working at Kakashla. They had uncovered part of an extraordinary mural with colors so fresh that it seemed to have been painted only yesterday. Official excavations have now revealed a palace complex of the 8th and 9th centuries AD with pilastered rooms arranged around patios and plazas. There is nothing Maya about its flat-roofed architecture, but there are similarities to the Coevo palaces of Xochicalco and to the later Tula. The numerous murals appear on the structured, on the stuccoed walls and jams of Building A or Building of the Paintings, on the, t t on the talud or better or batter of the substructure of Building B, on a subterranean chamber called the Red Temple, and on two piers in the Venus Temple. The north and south murals flank a doorway and are associated with unfired clay relief showing Maya dignitaries seated on monster mask thrones. The north mural depicts a man with jaguar feet and completely clad in jaguar skin, standing on an elongated jaguar, recalling the bare skin rugs of a past generation. He holds an object suggesting that Maya ceremonial bar formed of tied up spears from which drip blue drops of water. A nearby glyph in Teotihuacan style is to be read as nine reptile eye. The frame is made up of symbols of water and fecundity. The jam has another figure clothed in jaguar pelt, 
pouring water as plants emerged from his navel. In the south mirror, the personage wears an eagle costume and has eagle feet, and he also holds a ceremonial bar in his arms. On the nearby jam, a black painted figure dances, carrying a large conch shell from which a distinctive red-haired figure emerges. Both murals suggest some sort of opposition or juxtaposition between eagles and jaguars, perhaps symbolic of the knightly orders which we know from post-classic Mexico. Such an opposition is vividly depicted on the Talud of Building B, on which is realistically painted a great battle in progress between jaguar-clad and feathered warriors. There is little doubt that the Kakashla artist had seen such conflict, for he depicts such grisly details as a day's victim, seated on the ground, holding his entrails in his hands. At the same time, the story is highly coded. The jaguar warriors are always victorious, while the defeated bird warriors are shown with heirloom costume elements reaching back to the Olmec period, as if they were symbolic of an older order. Art historian Mary Miller believes that such a battle had actually taken place, perhaps on the swampy plains of southwestern Campeche, but that it had been recast in supernatural terms, and that some of the contestants are improbably given the feet of eagles and jaguars. On piers marking the entry to a ritual space called the Venus Temple are found two striking anthropomorphic supernaturals marked with the central Mexican star sign and embellished with scorpion tails, most notably the constellation Scorpio. But most breathtaking of all is a magnificent polychrome wall painting flanking a stairway leading down to the subterranean Red Temple. Below, on the right of the scene, stands the Maya god El, Lord of Merchants, propped up beside him is his great carrying frame with his merchandise strapped to it. It is indeed probably no accident that the name of the site, Kakashla or Kakashlan means place of the carrying frame. In front of the god, as though hopping up these stairs, is the monstrous toe that symbolizes the 20 day period or Uinal among the Maya, along with a cacao tree and magic stalks of maize in which the ears have turned into the heads of the Maya maize god, but with the signature red hair found elsewhere at Kakashla. This may have been, in fact probably was, a cosmopolitan center controlling the old Teotihuacan trade routes, but the prestige symbolic language was now Maya, modulated to serve the needs of this cosmopolitan elite. The Kakashla murals are thoroughly Maya in their style. Both the naturalistic body proportions and the organic flowing profiles are diagnostic of the epiclassic Maya painting tradition in contrast with the more blocky geometric style of Teotihuacan and much of the rest of Highland Mexico. Figure poses also strongly recall Maya models. Particularly striking are the figures holding the Maya derived ceremonial bars, either of whom might be at home on the reliefs of Cebu, an important center on the Rio Pasión in the southern Maya lowlands, which was deeply involved in epiclassic disruptions of political landscape. Also telling is the use of a vegetable binder to form the paint medium a technique divined by art historian Diana Magaloni for Maya and Gulf Coast mural artists, but unknown in central Mexico, where pigments diluted with water were laid on fresh plaster in the true fresco technique. At the same time, the writing that accompanies these things is not Maya, but of a hybrid of earlier Teotihuacan and Oaxacan scripts, along with innovative elements, the whole used mainly to designate the names of key figures. Certainly the main audience was not Maya lords, but central Mexican elites. Except for these important artistic characteristics, there is little in the cultural record of Kakashla that indicates a larger Maya presence, suggesting that these traits were imported by an intermediate group like the Omeka Xicalanca, who would have acquired such traits in their southern Gulf Coast homeland, immediately adjacent to the Maya area. Equally intriguing is the presence of a large number of female figurines in an offering found in the nearby site of Xochitecat, many of whom of which, rather, share important elements with southern Gulf Coast female figures. Xochitecat, which had an important pre-classic occupation, was re-inhabited during the Epiclassic when the female figures were deposited in, an, in the entire pyramid aligned to the Kakashla Palace. The group of figures with raised hands, filled teeth, and pronounced smiles shared those traits with figures on the Gulf Coast, although the slap-like bodies at Xochitecat follow local practices. Archaeologist Mari Carmen Serra and her team have identified numerous ritual and political offices for female figures, which along with the female dress of several Kakashla battle figures, point out to the important role of females in gender symbolism at these closely related sites, a trade shared with Epiclassic Southern Veracruz. 
Any description of the Ome Omeka Shikalanka will lack precision, however, because we know so little of the Omeka Shikalanka homeland, and until we do this, and until we do, this group will remain a cipher for Maya and Gulf Coast elements in the archaeological record, as well as a shadowy group of mobile conquerors in the historical documents. Another regional center that reached importance with the twilight or disappearance of Teotihuacan's hege hegemony is Xochicalco, strategically placed atop one of a string of defensively terraced hills in western Morelos. This cosmopolitan entrepot has been mapped by Kenneth Hirth of Pennsylvania State Uni University, who finds it to be the hub of a well-planned network of stone surface causeways with access to the site via well-guarded ramps. This immediately brings to mind the causeways or, or Sakbialb of classic Maya centers such as Tikal. Founded before AD 700 and active throughout the Upper Classic, Xochicalco had extensive foreign contacts, especially with the Maya area, Zapotec and Mixtec Oaxaca, and classic central Veracruz. In its most striking structure, the Temple of the Feathered Servant is a talud tablero platform, but the talud element is very high compared to the tablero. On the talud are sculpted reliefs of great undulating feathered serpents covered with cut shell symbols reminiscent of the feathered serpent floating in shells on the Temple of the Feathered Street de Otihuaca, um, of the Feathered Serpent de Otihuaca. The folds of the serpents' bodies form a kind of protective shelter to the repeated figure of a man seated tailor fashion with a headdress descended from the war serpent headdress of Teotihuacan, the latter again found on the Temple of the Feathered Serpent at that site. It is likely that the Xochicalco Temple was an attempt to re recreate that great central monument of Teotihuacan power, only, n only now with seated lords also inhabiting the space. As far as we know, there is absolutely no prototype for these seated figures in Highland Mexico. They are surely based upon seated rulers carved on late classic Maya jade plaques. Although the raised edges of the bodies recall reliefs found at El Tain in the Gulf Coast lowlands. A monumental glyphic group is centered on all four sides of the talud, given Teotihuacan style as nine reptile eyes surmounted by a house glyph with scrolls emanating from the top of the glyph. Nine reptile eye was also sighted several times at Kakashla, and the great scholar Alfonso Caso believed this to be equivalent to a nine wind. The name of the later culture hero, Getzkoat. While the other epigraphers are less certain of the wind identity for reptile eye, it is clear that this name or date is important in the epiclassic. Other dates or names based on the 260 day count are found elsewhere at Xochicalco, and like those of Kakashla, these show resemblances to both Teotihuacan and Oaxaca. The elites of Xochicalco, like those of Kakashla, were drawn to the script and imagery of the illustrious past, as well as to that of the powers in the present, a situation which led to the eclectic nature of epiclassic styles and scripts. There are numerous caves on the hill on which Xochicalco was built, which could have been used for storage purposes by the local population, as Kenneth Hurt suggests. Directly adjacent to the main ceremonial plaza, and not far from the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, is a cave which has been transformed into an underground observatory. A man-made vertical tube leads up to the surface, and on the two days a year when the sun is at its zenith, or directly overhead, a beam of sunlight penetrates the shaft to the cave floor. This underground zenith observatory is the descendant of recently discovered underground chambers at Teotihuacan, where the same celestial phenomena were marked. Xochicalco Maya influence and perhaps even Maya directed but with important ties to the regional past seems to form a kind of bridge between classic and post-classic central Mexico. So Chicalco's main ball court, for instance, with its I-shaped layout, has exactly the same dimensions as the northern ball court at Tula of the Toltecs, which must be several centuries later. Cholula Following the withdrawal of Teotihuacan hegemony from central Mexico, the builders of Cholula incorporated prestige architectural elements from the now fallen center. For instance, beneath the west face of the Great Pyramid has been uncovered a stone-faced temple substructure with three superimposed talud tableros, but here the tableros are embellished with a textile-like mosaic motif not seen at Teotihuacan. Relations with contemporary Gulf Coast peoples are evidenced by a patio with four stone altars, two of which are associated with slab-like stella carved in relief with the interlaced motifs typical of the classic Veracruz style. According to ethno-historic accounts, Cholula was taken over by the Gulf Coast group known as the Omeca Xicalanca, who made it their capital, from which base they controlled the high plateau of Puebla and Tlaxcala. This is the same group we met at Cacaxla, 
Both the Stella format and the interlaced scroll style seen first at Cholula during this period were also found in the probable homeland of the Omeka Shikalanka, as was a colorful Maya influenced ceramic style. For it was under this group that the potters of Cholula began to develop the fine polychrome wares that were to become the most coveted containers in all of ancient Mexico. The Omeka Shikalanka were overthrown by the Toteca Chichimeca, more commonly known as the Toltecs, sometime around 1200. These people left the Great Pyramid as a monumental ruin, moving the center of worship to the Temple of Quetzalcoatl under the current town square. Finally, in AD 1359, the Kingdom of Huashotzingo, which was in a state of perpetual war with the Aztecs, took over this, the holiest site in Mexico. But to all the post-classic Mexicans, the Great Pyramid, which in its final form covered an area of 25 acres and reached a height of 180 feet, was one of the wonders of their country. Cantona Cantona, like Cholula but unlike the rest of the epic classic powers, had an important classic period occupation. Angel Garcia Cook, the chief archaeologist at this impressive but little visited and little known site north of the Oriental Basin in the state of Puebla, describes the classic period city as founded on volcanic flow which must have supplied much of the building material. This material was cut and then placed without the use of mortar. Cantona controlled the Oyamelez Zaragoza obsidian source only six and a quarter miles away, and trade in this product must have been a major resource for the site. According to Garcia Cook, suddenly ar around the year 600, the site filled with walkways leading to carefully delimited walled residential compounds. These compounds are not the apartment buildings of Teotihuacan, but groups of house mounds that have been sealed and given one controlled point of entry. Access to the Acropolis, where much of the sacred architecture was located, was carefully controlled through walkways and entry gates. The entire site became fortified and densely populated, and a moat was constructed at the most vulnerable point. The city was to remain a fortified center until its abandonment around AD 1000. Taken as a whole, the desire of the epiclassic Cantona elite to keep enemies at bay was matched only by their desire to control circulation throughout the city itself. At some point, Catona became a center for playing the rubber ball game on I-shaped masonry courts. To date, some 24 ball courts have been found at the site, 18 of which the archaeologist believes were functioning at one time. El Tain. In accordance with the importance of ball court equipment in their art, there are no fewer than 17 ball courts at El Tain, an elite center about 5 miles southwest of Papantla in the rich oil producing zone of northern Veracruz. The surrounding land is highly fertile for maize, cacao, tobacco, and vanilla, all of which are still grown. The site derives its name from the belief of the modern Totonac that twelve old men called Tahin lived in the ruins and are lords of the thunderstorm, and therefore the equivalent of the rain god. El Tahin was first occupied during the Classic when it was a village among many others in the area. Recent work by Arturo Pascual Soto in several of these surrounding early sites has revealed a thriving Classic period culture with decoration of tripod cylinder vase supports that initially owes much to Teotihuacan. Morgan El Grande, the most important of these outliers, contains a classic period ball court with carved relief benches that prefigure El Tain's central architectural form. Cerro Grande, another outlier, has produced a large classic period stella fragment, on which a figure in high relief is shown frontally, holding a feathered bag with feet splayed to either side. Again, echoes of this style and format will appear in some of the earliest monumental art found in El Tain itself. Sometime in the 7th or early 8th century, El Tain began the systematic conquest and rebuilding of these important regional sites, and much of the evidence for the classic culture is found in the fill-in of Tain-style epiclassic buildings. Epiclassic El Tain is very extensive, its nucleus covering about 146 acres, but subsidiary ruins are scattered over several thousand acres. The site is set among low hills, with the lower area dotted with pyramids and ball courts, and an upper area of elaborately decorated palaces and other structures for elite gatherings. The decorations in both paint and carved stone are done in the last major manifestation of classic Veracruz style, as seen in the use of raised outlines and scroll forms throughout the site. The central core of the site is divined by the Pyramid of the Niches, a relatively small four-sided structure of wonderful symmetry, faced with carved stone blocks rising in six tiers to an upper sanctuary. A single stairway climbs to the top, flanked by balustrades embellished with a step and fret motif. The combination of niche surrounded by flying cornice, seen most strikingly in this building, was certainly emblematic of the site, 
appearing in other areas of northern Veracruz as Dain extended its reach. The pyramid of, of niches was covered with a layer of stucco and painted red, as were most of El Dain's structures. A few, however, were a vivid blue. War standards were raised on large rectangular bases at the foot of the structure, and just to the south of the most important ball court activities were held in the main ceremonial court. Old other stone buildings at Otain are very similar in their architectural design, the step and fret motif being particularly common. Palace-like buildings with colonnaded doorways were roofed with massive concrete slabs poured over wooden scaffolds, rather an advanced construction technique for the day. The building of the columns is the largest palace complex at the site. The drums of the columns are carved with narrative scenes from the ceremonial life of the city. The most interesting of these depicts a procession of victorious warriors being st bringing stripped captives to the enthroned ruler, a personage with a calendrical name 13 Rabbit. Before him lies the corpse of a disemboweled victim. Similar names taken from the 260-day count are found here and elsewhere at El Taim, but with the exception of a small number of texts on ceramic vessels, it was used exclusively for naming figures. Above all, the inhabitants of El Taim were obsessed with the ball game, human sacrifice, and death, three concepts closely interwoven in the Mesoamerican mind. The courts, which are up to 197 feet long, are formed by two facing walls, with stone surfaces either vertical or battered. Interestingly, nowhere is the game itself depicted. Instead, there are references to the complex rituals surrounding the ball game. Among these ball court images, the sixth and the south ball court are the most elaborate, describing a series of rituals glimpsed only in parts elsewhere in Mesoamerica. The sequence begins on a panel where two facing figures speak to each other, indicating their alliance. Later, a figure is dressed for war in handed spears that appear to emerge from a celestial supernatural. Decapitation sacrifice in the ball court itself is depicted in a later panel, which could only happen if the raid had been successful in securing captives. On each panel, always nearest the center of the court, a skeletal figure rises from a jar floating in the water. This probably refers to the place of the skull in the center of the court, which the later Aztecs conceived of as a spring that was the origin of agricultural fecundity. The central panels on either side of the court show the ascension of the Tain ruler and his control of the sacred spring at the behest of the gods. El Tain's destruction was by fire, traditionally by 1200, but perhaps by 1,000 if recent evidence for post tahin squatter settlements around that date are taken into account. Rehomodas Potters An exuberant style in pottery sprang up during the Classic period in a zone of central Veracruz fronting the Gulf of Mexico near the modern port capital of the state. Name Remojadas from the site at which they are most abundant, Tens of thousands of hollow clay figurines were fashioned in a naturalistic style from which much ethnographic data can be drawn. The roots of the art reach back to the late pre-classic, but most production was during the epic classic, when Remojadas figurines have close kinship with those of the Maya to the east and some interesting similarities of Xochitecat to the west. Features such as faces were generally cast from clay molds and a black asphalt paint was used to heighten details or to indicate face paint. The subjects are standing or seated humans, both male and female, curiously infantile boys and girls with laughing faces and filled teeth, ball players, lovers or friends in swings, and warriors. The gods are also portrayed, Shipetotec, as represented by a priest wearing the skin of a flayed captive, the death god, and the old fire god, often shown as a wrinkled old man. The most impressive of these hollow ceramic figures are near life-size and descend from the classic tradition of monumental ceramic sculpture at Cerro de las Mesas. Thirteen of these hollow monumental figures, all females, were found in a single epiclassic deposit at El Zapotal near Cerro de las Mesas. The females were depicted both seating and standing, but all wore long skirts and serpent belts and have been identified as Cihuateteo, or the spirits of women who died in childbirth. Several of the sculptures were decapitated and all were smashed during deposition. Associated are numerous smiling figures and male warriors and ritual figures, but these are significantly smaller than the monumental females. Also associated is a mound of disarticulated human bone that included 82 skulls. 
This entire program is oriented to a sanctuary inside of which sits a striking overlife sized seated death god of uncooked clay, with remnants of the extensive painted decoration still adhering to the surface. Valley of Oaxaca The decline of Monte Alban appears more gradual than that of Teotihuacan, making a clear break with the classic period in Oaxaca harder to define. Regional centers like Lambitiaco and Suchiquitongo seem to have increased their power at the expense of declining Monte Alban and the practice of writing on monumental art spread throughout Oaxaca. Elite tombs found in several of these centers contain carved panels which recount the genealogies and legitimate rulers of epic classic lords. An example is the Noriega Stone, where Javier Urcid has identified both early childhood rituals and the later accession to the power of Lady Six Owl, represented as the diminutive figure in the center of the upper register. The Nuinya style and script is another interesting cultural development that seems to have flowered late in the history of Monte Alban. Located to the west of the Oaxaca Valley in the hot lowlands, these sites and monuments are related to Monte Alban style and script, but they also indicate connections with Xochicalco, the Pacific coast of Guatemala and the Gulf Coast. Farther west and south, sites on the Pacific coast around the Rio Verde drainage begin erecting monuments obviously derived from the Monte Alban tradition but also evincing relationships with the Central Highlands. But what is perhaps most unusual in Oaxaca at this time is the presence of locally made pottery imitating Bal Balancan fine orange, a ceramic associated with, Put with the Putun Maya of Tabasco and southern Campeche, and another group aping the slateware of Maya sites like the Uxmal and Caba in the northern Yucatan Peninsula. The Maya connection again. Northwestern Mexico While farmers had moved into the northwest fringes of Mesoamerica by the beginning of our era, it was not until the Upper Classic that we see large settlements in this frontier zone formed by the modern states of Durango, Zacatecas, and Sinaloa. La Quemada, which, flourished from, which flourished rather from 8500 to 900, occupies a hilltop 820 feet above the surrounding valley floor and is protected by a strategically located defensive walls, behind which the bulk of the population lived. Ben Nelson's work at the site has shown that warfare was a central concern, indicated by the display of large quantities of disarticulated bones as trophies. This was true not only of La Quemada, but also at the smaller centers in the area. One of the most important architectural innovations is the Tzompantli, or skull rack. Later, this building type was important to Mesoamericans as a place to exhibit trophy heads related to the ball game de decapitation sacrifice. It is no surprise then that at La Quemada and other sites in the region we also find I-shaped ball courts. Other innovative architectural forms include the colonnaded hall, often with an adjoining sunken patio, and the soaring steep-sided pyramid. A series of roadways organized the immediate area into a set of linked settlements ruled, rather harshly it would seem, from La Quemada. The Huicho Indians of adjacent Jalisco recount that at one point an evil priest lived, lived on a great rock which was also a fortress protected by eagles and jaguars. This ruler priest required tribute in, pay, in peyote and would not let the people acquire the items necessary to worship these gods, shells, feathers, and salt. The people appealed to these gods who then destroyed the leader and his aides with 20 days of heat. This may be an indigenous account of the end of La Quemada for the fortress was burned around AD 900 and never reoccupied. Alta Vista, located 106 miles northwest of La Quemada, was its contemporary, exhibiting much the same bellicose nature and several of the same architectural innovations. In addition, great quantities of turquoise have been found at the site, indicating the first large concentration of this precious stone destined to become important to later Mesoamericans. Turquoise has first appeared in the Preclassic period, mainly in West Mexico, and always in small amounts. In Alta Vista, there was large-scale processing of the ore into, into regular tesserae for turquoise mosaic objects, at which stage it could be traded to the rest of Mesoamerica. Large amounts of turquoise mosaic objects were also laid into elite graves at Alta Vista itself. Although Alta Vista was the center of a vast mining industry centering largely on M Malachite, Azurite, Ochir, Cinnabar, and Weathered Chert, there are no high-quality turquoise deposits in the area. 
trace element analysis carried out through neutron activation by Garmin Harbottle at the Brookhaven National Laboratory has shown that much of the raw turquoise came from mines in the American Southwest, especially from New Mexico. It is fairly clear that the Northwestern frontier was instrumental in the transmission of Mesoamerican trades into the American Southwest, in particular, the colonnaded masonry building and the platform pyramid, the ball court and the game played on it, the organization of settlements into a linked hierarchy with roads, copper bells, and perhaps even the taste for turquoise encrusted objects. It is also clear that these trades run along a trading route, a turquoise road, so to speak, analogous to the famous Silk Road of the Old World that, bo that bound civilized and barbarian alike into a single cultural whole. The End of the Upper Classic Around the, 80, around the year AD 900, many of the cities that had forged a post Teotihuacan order went into their own decline and, and eclipse. Much of the West Mexican area, including the mining area around Alta Vista and the Teuchitlan traditional heartland had collapsed by this date. Certainly, the two sites with substantial Maya connections, Cacaxla and Tochicalco, were abandoned by this time. It is probably no coincidence that the central Maya area itself was going through a complete collapse between AD 800 and 900, the sign of the times being their failure to erect dynastic monuments dated in the long count system and by clear-cut vandalism and defacement. As, the fall of Teo, as at the fall of Teotihuacan, there must have been much movement of peoples, shifting alliances, and a certain amount of social chaos at the end of the Epic Classic. Out of this was to emerge a new order, the Toltec, which was to link the Maya and ancient Mexico yet again, create a new capital, and imitate a new art style. This concludes Chapter 7.